Go over the scriptures about the different names for the day of the Lord. Let's do that before I go. See these different names for it? Let's just take a look at a scripture that calls that last thousand year day different names. Let's take a look at that. See if we can find something here. Jesus calls it the last day. And we talked about that last week. And this is the Father's will, which hath sent me, that all that he has given me I should not lose, but should raise them up on the last day. That's the, that's the last day. Seventh trumpet. When do people get raised up? When do people get raised up? At the seventh trumpet, which is the beginning of what? The day of the Lord, which is also called what? The last day, right? So we see this, the, the day of the Lord called the last day in several different places. Well, now we get this idea of the Sabbath rest. Again, like the word Trinity is not in the Bible and the word Bible is not in the Bible and the word rapture is not in the Bible and all these different things. We get the idea of Sabbath rest, which is not clearly written down. Hey, Sabbath rest. Clearly, we get the idea and understanding about the Sabbath rest being this last millennial time period or a thousand year day from scriptures like Hebrews uh, chapter four. Let's take a look at Hebrews chapter four, verses four to six. Hebrews chapter four, verses four says, he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on the wise and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter my rest, seeing therefore it remains that some must enter therein. Some still need to enter into this rest, right? He's talking about the seventh day that God rested on his seventh day. That's a thousand year day, don't forget. And some need to enter into this rest. Interesting, isn't it? Now, it's certainly metaphorical and, and spiritual also that we enter into a rest when we come into Christ. We're no longer trying to get to heaven on our own works, which the Bible says is impossible, uh, that we're relying on the work of Jesus uh, if we obey him, we're relying on the, and it's talking about entering into this rest through obedience. Okay. That's getting ahead of myself. So we're talking about a Sabbath rest. We're talking about the day that God rested from all his works called the Sabbath day, the seventh day, the day that God rested from his works, tying it into the creation days, which we believe is each day was a thousand years. And then he's talking about people entering into that rest, seeing therefore it remains that some must enter therein. And they to whom it was first preached entered not because of unbelief, talking about uh, some people chose not to enter into that. All right. Now we see right here in verse 11, let us labor therefore to enter into that rest. Now that's kind of a paradox, isn't it? I've got to labor to rest. Everybody with me on that? Everybody understand? This, this sums the Christian, the real Christian faith and real Christian salvation up in one verse. I mean, if you really want to understand Christianity in one verse, this is it. We are laboring to enter into the rest. And that, that's what Jesus says. Strive to enter in. Pray every day that you're counted worthy. If your right hand sins, cut it off. I mean, all this effort, my goodness, there's a lot of effort involved in being saved. You, uh, but that's Jesus's teachings, not man's. You see, there's a difference between man telling you how to be saved and Jesus telling you how to be saved. Can I get an amen? What does man say about getting saved? Don't do nothing. What does Jesus say about being saved? Cut off your right hand, strive to enter in, pray every day that you're counted worthy. Labor, do, pick up your cross. Now, who are you going to listen to? You're going to listen to man, Stephen Anderson. You're going to listen to those guys saying, you know, Robert Breaker. You're going to listen to what man's telling you to do to be saved, Martin Luther. Or are you going to listen to Jesus who said, cut your right hand off if it's sinning? Okay, you can listen to whoever you want to. I'm just saying, for me, the Bible's very clear labor to enter in. And that's not because of your own filthy dead works. It's because Jesus told you to do it, which makes it faithfulness. Anything Jesus tells you to do and you do it, it's faith, not dead works. This 
cannot be emphasized enough. We could spend a whole Bible study on this. Anything Jesus tells you to do is not dead works. It's called faith. When you do what Jesus tells you to do, it's called believing. It's called faith in the Son of God. You got to wrap your head around that. You got to understand that's a principle that the devil does not want you to grasp. That believing in Jesus means laboring to enter in because that's what he said to do. That believing in Jesus means doing what he said. That's how you're saved, doing what Jesus says, i.e. faith in Christ. All right, so anyway, if we get this millennial kingdom rest concept, that Sabbath day rest that we enter into now spiritually and metaphorically and literally when the thousand year period is uh, in, in context. It, it will literally be a thousand year day, literally. So we call it the Sabbath day as well, the day of the Lord, the last day, the Sabbath day rest. We get those, this concept from Hebrews chapter four. Let's move on. Second Peter chapter three, the day of the Lord, which is called more than anything. The day of the Lord, uh, this day is called the day of the Lord more than anything else. So this is the common term for the last day, for judgment day, for the day of Christ when he returns. Return of the Lord is called the day of the Lord more than any other title that we have uh, on this list right here. More than any other term that you can come up with for that particular time period, the day of the Lord, it's called that more than anything. So, but we do have other, other, other titles for it, like the day of the trumpet, remember. Remember, we we're talking about the day of the trumpet. Uh, but before we get to that scripture, judgment day, Psalms 50. Our God shall come and shall not keep silent. A fire devours before him. He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Now he's going to judge his people too. Hey, this is interesting because judgment is for both the righteous and the wicked. Judgment is for both the righteous and the wicked. And that's on the day of the Lord. Like we've been saying, first Corinthians chapter one, verse eight, who shall also confirm you unto the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. The day of our Lord Jesus Christ. So that's the day of Jesus Christ also. That's the, that's the day of the Lord, right? Revelation 23. This is part of the thousand year millennial kingdom. We get a thousand years mentioned five times in Revelation chapter 20, I think. Five times. How many times is the three and a half year period mentioned? Five times in the book of Revelation. 1260 days of protections mentioned twice. 42 months of power to the Antichrist is mentioned twice. And a time times and half a time is mentioned once. Five times. When God mentions time, time in the book of Revelation, it seems to be most usually literal, most usually literal. In Revelation chapter two and three, we see one of the churches being persecuted for 10 days. That's literally 10 days, not thousand year days, 10, 24 hour days. We see China putting, uh, persecuting people for how long? 10 days. I made that connection a while back and I said, isn't that interesting? I think it's Pergamos. Some of the Christians were being persecuted for 10 days. Will God revive that 10 day period in the latter times? Probably. See, I don't believe in one or the other. I, I, I tend to learn more about the Bible when I keep an open mind that there's more than one manifestation of prophecies. Like man, prophecies can kind of, uh, they can be breadcrumb prophecies and there can be a bigger manifestation of prophecy. Sometimes you'll see prophecies unfolding a little bit. Sometimes you'll see prophecies unfolding with reflections and similarities, and then you are waiting for the big manifestation and the final outcome of that prophecy. And we get a lot of that in the book of Revelation. Thousand years is literally a thousand year period. I'm trying to think of a time in the Bible that in the book of Revelation that may be metaphorical. I'm sure there are some. You know, when he says the time is at hand in, in Revelation 1, and that was 2,000 years ago, 
Well, when you understand that you're in the last days, the last 2,000 years, you understand the time is at hand. It makes perfect sense right here. Let me show you real quick. When Jesus is talking about the last days and the time is at hand, he's talking about uh, this right here. Let's go up here. He's talking out of seven days, out of 6,000 years, plus the 7,000 day millennial rest. Let's just go up here and look at it. You understand the last days are the last 2,000 years. And that makes sense now when Jesus says the time is at hand. Because to God, it is at hand. Here's the last day, the last 2,000 years. There's the first 4,000 years before Christ. Jesus comes, gives us the book of Revelation and says the time is at hand. We got the last days. The last days, Paul talks about the last days. And so we're talking about this last, this last 2,000 years. And to God, it's quick, coming quickly. And it, it is coming quickly. It may not seem like it logically to us, but it makes perfect sense that he says the time's at hand. We've had 4,000 years of human history. Now we're in, down into the last days. The last days, Hebrews 1, 2, and 2 Peter 3, 3 talks about the last days. It's talking about these last 2,000 years. Now we're waiting on that, that seventh day hasn't come yet. We're waiting on that millennial kingdom rest the day of the Lord, judgment day. We're waiting on the, the day of the trumpet and all that stuff is still, still coming, still coming. So let's get back over here. All right, we already looked at the scriptures about the day of the trumpet. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on that. And then Ezekiel 33, 30 verse three, the day of the Lord is near. It shall be a time of the heathen, which is interesting language, a time of the heathen. So... The whole thousand year period, God's, Christ is going to be ruling and reigning and, and some of the elect will be ruling and reigning with a rod of iron over the heathen nations. The whole day, the whole thousand year period is a day, is a time of the heathen to put those nations under the authority of righteousness. So that's what it's called too. Obadiah 15 says the same thing. The day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen. And, I, and there's probably more scriptures about this. We got vengeance, the day of vengeance. The day of the Lord is a day of vengeance right here. Jeremiah 46, 10. He's going to take vengeance. He does in the beginning. Keeps all the nations in line for a thousand years. And at the end, he gets vengeance on them again. Isaiah 63, 4. The day of vengeance is in mine heart. That's the day of the Lord. Right? So Revelation chapter six, we see the fifth trumpet opening and we see the Christians being beheaded and standing before God in heaven. And they cried with a loud voice, how long, O Lord, do you not go down and avenge our blood upon them who dwell upon the earth? Now, this is during the great tribulation hour, the 1260 days of the 42 months that Satan is crushing the Christians. They're all dying and they're waiting on God to go, go, go get him, Lord, go get him. And he's waiting. He says that they should wait a little season until their fellow servants and brethren should be killed. Now we know not everybody's going to be killed. The two witnesses are going to be killed. So God's got to wait for their ministry to be over at the end of their three and a half year ministry. The two witnesses that they're killed. That has to happen. The dead have to rise first before the first resurrection can take place, before the rapture can take place. So that's what he's waiting on. So this is not vengeance. All this dying for their faith is not the wrath of God. The wrath of God is a day of vengeance. And these are scriptures to prove to you that all this suffering and dying and killing is not the wrath of God. It's the wrath of, of, of the devil, really. Okay, so we got scriptures about him removing the sinners from the earth, Isaiah 34, 8. For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompenses. He's going to recompense for the controversies of Zion. What do we got here? Isaiah 13, 9. The day of the Lord comes cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger. He shall destroy the sinners out of it. Now, you might think to yourself, if the day of the Lord, God is destroying the sinners out of the earth, then 
what's up with the sinners being on the earth for a thousand years? And see, that's where discernment comes in. He will eventually root out all the sinners off of the earth at the end of this particular day. This is another point in being that the day is a thousand years. So you see in verse nine here, the day of the Lord comes. And what does it say? He shall destroy all sinners out of the earth. Again, you have to understand that that is not in the blink of an eye at the beginning of the day of the Lord, that it will be completed at the end of the day of the Lord after Satan is loosed out of the bottomless pit and all the heathen sinful nations are burned up with fire when he calls fire down from heaven to devour them. That happens at the end of the thousand years. You know what? I want to take this passage here and I want to tie this into that scripture in Revelation 20 verse 9 because it belongs right with this. Fire down from heaven. Let me click that note. Yeah, it... it, it, it uh, Yep, Isaiah 13, Isaiah 13, 9 deserves to be right in with all these other scriptures right here about fire coming down out of heaven, killing the sinners. Because, you know, in one scripture, it's, it's at the end of the thousand years. But over here, we don't really see that mentioned. It doesn't clarify that this happens at the end, but it does. So Isaiah 13, let's put them side by side here so you guys can see it very, very clearly. Very, very clearly, this is when it happens. Give me an amen if you see this. On the left, you see Isaiah 13, 9, talking about the day of the Lord, destroying all the wicked. Isaiah 13, 9. Oh, on the right side, you see Revelation 29, where fire comes down out of heaven and devours them all. Are you guys with me out there? Anybody paying attention to these connections? This is the same thing. This is when it happens. This is when it happens. Isaiah 13, 9 happens in Revelation 29. That's when he destroys all the sinners off the face of the earth. <laughs> so, all right, guys. <laughs> There's a bunch of more stuff going on here. Fire melting the elements. Do I need to get into all those scriptures? Because there's a bunch of scriptures about fire melting the elements. But we know when that happens. It happens right here in Revelation 29. Fire comes down out of heaven to devour them all. Okay, every scripture that you see with fire and the day of the Lord in the same scripture, just remember Revelation 29. There's fire coming down from God at the end of the thousand years. That's when it has to take place, in my opinion.